severe damage uh, that Citizens United is doing uh, to our democracy. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. President, I would uh, yield the floor. Mr. President. Mr. President, it's my understanding I am to be recognized at 2, and we are about 2.01 uh, for uh, 10 minutes. And I know the leader will have uh, uh, something to say about uh, 2.15 in regards to the progress of this Senator, bill. Senator, it's recognized. I appreciate that so much. Mr. President, I rise today to speak on, uh, on the legislation that is actually before us, as opposed to the topic before. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act and uh, we are currently debating that. In addition to reauthorizing the user fee uh, agreements, this legislation includes many other important provisions. Members should know what's in this bill and just how important these provisions are. Language to permanently reauthorize uh, pediatric research uh, incentives, programs to incentive antibiotic research and development, and more transparency and accountability for the FDA and stakeholders, which we hope will address drug shortages. That is a big problem, not only in urban areas, but in the rural health care delivery system. Every state, every senator ought to be aware of that, and I'm sure they're hearing about it. In May, I joined Senators Reed, Murray, Alexander in introducing the Better Pharmaceuticals and Devices for Children Act. Uh, that's the BPDCA. I don't think that makes a very good acronym, so I'm not even going to try it. Back in 1997, by Congress passed the Best Pharmaceutical for Children Act, which acknowledged the importance of ensuring medications were effective and safe for children by providing an incentive for pharmaceutical companies to invest in pediatric research. And in 2003, with the passage of the Pediatric Research Equity Act, why Congress required that the pharmaceutical companies to engage in these studies. Now, these bills are often referred to as the carrot and the stick approach for pediatric drug development. Now, I prefer carrots to sticks around here, especially mandates, but they have proven over time to work, the carrot and stick approach. Since the enactment of these laws, approximately 426 drug labels have been revised with important uh, pediatric information, and the number of off-label drugs used in children has declined from 80 to 50 percent. That's certainly good news. In 2007, a complementary uh, initiative to promote the development of pediatric medical uh, devices, that's the Pediatric Medical Device Safety and Improvement Act, was enacted. Now, this law has resulted in a five-fold increase in the number of small market medical devices designated for uh, pediatric use. Now, the Better Pharmaceuticals and Devices for Children Act will permanently extend these worthwhile programs while providing some real predictability and accountability for pediatric drug and medical device development. The legislation also includes the Generating, pardon me, the Generating Antibiotic Incentives Act and I joined with Senators Blumenthal and Corker uh, in supporting this bill um, as of last year. This title contains provisions that aim to boost development of products to treat serious and life-threatening infections, something that is a growing problem in all of our hospitals. It provides meaningful market incentives and reduces, get this, reduces regulatory burdens. Glory be, here's a bill that actually reduces uh, regulations to encourage development of new antibiotics. Why? Well, the antibiotic pipeline has slowed, Mr. President, to an alarming rate. According to the FDA, the approval of such drugs has decreased by 70 percent since the mid-1980s. This is unacceptable. The development of just one new antibiotic can take upwards of 10 years. We must act now to avoid a potential health care crisis. Now, when I'm back in Kansas, and I know when other senators are back in their states, and talking to folks about health care, I often hear about the problem with drug shortages. Now, when a problem exists in an urban setting, simply multiply that ten times, and that's what we have in our rural areas. This is never more true than in the issue of drug shortages. This is a crisis. 
As difficult as it is to hear from my hospital administrators and pharmacists in Kansas about the difficulties they are having in getting drugs to fill uh, prescriptions for patients, nothing compares to the patients and families of patients who can't get their drugs, who can't get their treatment, who are already scared about their future, and they can't get their life-saving medication due to shortages. This is unacceptable. This is why I joined together with a number of my colleagues on the Health Committee to work together to see if we could come to a bipartisan consensus on a way to alleviate at least some of the burden that drug shortages do create. The legislation now requires reporting on drug shortages, but also, also does provide some transparency and accountability in the hope that we can get to the root cause of this problem. Now, not everything in this legislation is what I would have done if I had my choice. That's obviously the case probably with every senator and every major bill that we uh, must make decisions on. But I am certain that many of my colleagues on the Health Committee are thinking the same thing. But I think we are pleased that we were able to come to a bipartisan consensus on this legislation and in addressing many of the issues that are affecting Kansans and the rest of Americans. Just talked to a fellow last night on the telephone said, why can't you all work together? Why can't you pass something in a bipartisan way? This legislation is a good example of exactly what that gentleman was talking about and what a lot of Americans are concerned about. In that regard, I really want to thank Chairman Harkin, Ranking Member Enzi, for all of their work, all of the work by their staff, our staff, and the work of their staff over the past years and months in putting together this important piece of legislation. This took a long time, it took a lot of effort, a lot of hard work. Their commitment to a bipartisan process and their willingness to communicate with all the members of the Health Committee has led us through a relatively non-contentious markup, and I hope the same will happen as we consider this legislation on the floor. I yield back my time. President, no, Mr. Before. President. Oh. Mr. President. Senator from New York is recognized. Thank you, and I thank my friend from Kansas for finishing his speech in a timely manner. <coughs> uh, for the last two years, I'm here to talk a little bit about the Disclose Act and Citizens United. Now, for the last two years, you've heard us talk about the need for full disclosure of money donated to campaigns. It's time for Congress to stop stalling and let the American voters find out where the money being spent on elections is coming from once and for all. All of our predictions of the aftermath of the flawed Citizens United decision, unfortunately, are coming true. This decision handed a megaphone to the wealthiest voices among us and strapped a muzzle on every other American. Sure, average Americans can talk to one another, but not spending $10 million on TV ads and we know what kind of effect that has. If anything, the situation is even worse than we could have possibly anticipated, because unlimited spending by just a handful of the wealthiest Americans has made true democracy in danger. A true democracy of one person, one vote, of true equality, worrisome when you have such huge amounts of money being spent by so few people who seem to speak with one voice and one concerted point of view. The list of the top donors to super PACs reads like a who's who of the richest people in America. The contributions to super PACs that were released in the most recent disclosure reports are truly astonishing. Six-figure sums seem like pocket change now compared with today's trend of seven and eight-figure donations. Let's take Bob Perry, for instance, top donor to Mitt Romney's Super PAC, Restore Our Future. You may remember him as the former top donor to Swift Vets and POWs for Truth, the group that ran smear ads questioning John Kerry's military service in 2004. When you add up his donations to Super PACs this cycle, we have almost $14 million of political influence from just one man. Another example is Harold Simmons. When you combine his personal donations with the corporation he owns with his wife, you get contributions of over $17 million to six different super PACs. And because disclosures to the FEC <coughs> are only made publicly available once a month, 
This paints a fraction of the picture of total super PAC spending, and the reports don't even address spending through so-called nonprofit organizations. As we all know, 501c4 organizations are able to serve as conduits for huge sums of anonymous funding that are never publicly disclosed, and I call them so-called because they function the same as the super PACs, except they can't say vote for or vote against. But their effect on campaigns, obviously intended, is just as real. It doesn't stop at the federal level. We're also seeing the concern over corporate spending at the state level through the Montana case, American Tradition Partnership versus Attorney General Bullock. This case hinges on a challenge to Montana's century-old campaign finance law by special interest groups who want to take advantage of the anonymous political spending made possible by Citizens United. In fact, the fundraisers in this case, a group called American Tradition Partnership, solicits contributors by actually bragging about their secrecy. In their promotional literature, they promise donors, quote, we're not required to report the name or the amount of any contribution that we'd receive. So, if you decide to support this program, no politician, no bureaucrat, no radical environmentalist will ever know you helped make this program possible, unquote. It's no surprise, given the amounting concern about the corruptive effects of unlimited and often anonymous campaign spending on our democracy, that so many individuals and groups have filed amicus break briefs in this case, including Senators Whitehouse and McCain, several House Democrats, and dozens of others urging the court to uphold Montana's 100-year-old law. We cannot sit idly by and watch our democracy put up for sale to the highest bidders, Full disclosure, the kind that the Disclose Act of 2012 requires, is so necessary to shed light on which groups and individuals are funding our elections, to keep some modicum of faith that the voters at least know what's going on. In 2010, <clears throat> the original Disclose Act passed the House, had widespread support in the Senate and from the President, but failed to gain cloture by one vote because not one Republican was willing to step across the aisle and do what clearly the American people regard as the right thing. Well, now there's no excuse. We've removed the original provisions that my Republican colleagues most objected to. All that remains is disclosure and disclaimer, plain and simple. The time to act on campaign finance reform is now, while America's richest billionaires can afford to keep contributing millions of dollars to super PACs and 501Cs, America cannot afford to be kept in the dark any longer. Mr. President, I yield the floor. The uh, clerk will hold the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Mr. Alexander. President. Majority Leader is recognized. I ask unanimous consent to call the quorum be terminated. Without objection, and the Majority Leader is recognized. Mr. President, the first thing we're going to uh, talk about, I've had conversations the last few days, in fact, longer period of time than that, with Senators Vitter and Senator Coburn, Senator Johnson, Senator Shelby, and others on flood insurance. Like a lot of things that happen, this has become critical that we do something on flood insurance. It affects almost six million people, and we need to get something done on a more permanent basis. Um, there's been a general agreement. We don't have it in writing yet, but I just want to make sure the record's clear here on the floor of what my intention is, is that we would have a 60-day short-term extension in that extension, there would be language for a duration of 60 days that would include in that the second home subject as part of the underlying bill that Senator Colburn is focused on. That would be for 60 days. Then I would make, be happy to make a uh, statement here on the floor today that during the next work period that we will move to that bill, the flood insurance bill, so that we would have the opportunity to make it permanent. Um, it's very important we do that. It's um, with the economy being such as it is, we can't in this area and probably others, but this one, we can't have these short-term extensions. It doesn't allow people to do what they need to do. Um, 40,000 homes a day go through a process where they have to have flood insurance. If there's no flood insurance, that's 40,000 loans every day that will not be approved. So, um, Senator Johnson and Shelby have done good work to narrow down the list of amendments that we would have to consider when the Senate takes up this long-term flood insurance bill. Uh, it's my understanding there are um, uh, a dozen or so amendments, six, eight on each side. And, um, but I hope we can do that. If we can't uh, do that, we're going to have to go to the bill anyway, and I want to make sure how I, feel, I want to make sure that Senator Vitter, who's on the floor today, understands that that's my understanding of the things that he and I have talked about the last um, couple of weeks. The Senator from Louisiana. Mr. President, I, I thank the distinguished majority leader very much for this important announcement and this plan, and it certainly meets... Mr. President, it's my, it's my understanding that he was going to ask me a question because I don't want to lose the floor. Okay. Yeah, I have no intention of his losing the floor. I just want to thank him for the announcement and from my perspective it meets the two main goals we've been uh, in search of. First of all, making sure in the short term there's not a lapse of the program. That would be disastrous. That would cancel, as the majority leader suggested, thousands of good closings, really uh, put a hiccup in the economy for no good reason and, in addition, get to a permanent bill in the next work period. Uh, so I appreciate um, uh, the leader's announcement, and I would uh, also note, as he did, that there's been great work and great progress in narrowing the field of relevant amendments. I certainly hope that leads to uh, a limited and reasonable number of amendment votes, uh, as he does on the floor. Um, I understand what he said about if that becomes unwieldy, we just proceed with the bill uh, as is. But, but certainly it's my expectation. I'll continue to work on that amendment list so that we have a reasonable opportunity for relevant amendments. Mr. President. Majority Leader. I'm glad the Republican leaders on the floor, we've worked very hard to arrive at this point where I'm going to ask this consent agreement. I appreciate everyone's help and it takes everyone's help to get to where we are. That's why we call them unanimous consent agreements. 
I ask unanimous consent that the only first degree amendments in order to the bill that's now pending before the Senate be the following Bingaman 2111, 20, McCain 2107. Under the previous order, the motion to proceed to S3187 is agreed to. The clerk will report. Calendar number 400, S3187, a bill to amend the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to revise and extend the user fee programs for prescription drugs and medical devices and so forth and for other purposes. Under the previous order, amendment number 2122 is agreed to. Majority Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm sorry I got ahead of the chair a little bit. I ask unanimous consent that the only first degree amendments in order to the bill be the following. Bingaman 2111, McCain 2107, Sanders 2109, Murkowski 2108, Cardin 2125, Cardin 2141, Grassley 2121, Grassley 2129, Manchin 2151 is modified, Portman 2146 is modified, Portman 2145 is modified, Reed of Rhode Island 2126, Coburn 2132, Coburn 2131, Durbin 2127, Paul 2143, and Byrd 2130. That there be no second degree amendments in order prior to the votes in relation thereto. That there be no points of order or any motions or points of order to the amendments or the bill other than the budget points of order and applicable motions to waive or motions to table. That there be up to 30 minutes of debate on each of the amendments with the exception of the McCain Amendment which will have two hours of debate and 60 minutes on the bill, with all time equally divided in the usual form, that at 2 p.m. on Thursday, May 24th, all debate time be considered expired, and the Senate proceed to votes in relation to the amendments in the order listed above, that there be two minutes of debate equally divided in the usual form prior to each vote, that all, first, that all after the first vote be 10 minutes, and the following amendments be subject to a 60 vote uh, primitive threshold. It. 60 affirmative vote threshold. Bingman 2111, McCain 2107, Sanders 2109, Murkowski 2108. That upon disposition of the amendments, the bill be read a third time and the Senate proceed to vote on passage the bill as amended. That upon disposition of S3187, the Senate proceed to the consideration of calendar number 365 2343. That the only amendment in order to the bill be an amendment from a Republican leader or his designee, the text of which is identical to 2366. That there be 10 total minutes of debate on the amendment and the bill equally, and the bill equally divided between the two leaders or the designees prior to a vote on the McConnell, McConnell or designee amendment. That no amendment be in order to the McConnell or designee amendment, that no motions or points of order be in order to the amendment or the bill other than budget points of order, and the applicable motions to waive. That upon disposition of the amendment, the Senate proceed to vote on passage of the bill as amended, if amended, that the amendment and the bill be subject to a 60 vote affirmative vote threshold, that if the bill does not receive 60 affirmative votes, S. 2343 be returned to the calendar, and finally the motion to reconsider be with respect to the cloture vote on the motion to proceed to S. 2343 be withdrawn. Is there objection? Without objection, so what? So, Mr. President, we're going to have uh, votes on these amendments. It's my understanding I, that there's, thir there's time, 30 minutes per amendment. And we need to get as much of that done today as possible. We have an event for spouses tonight, so we're going to have to have, we're not going to, go, we're not going to be working late into the night. We have tomorrow to finish this. We should be able to do that. I hope we can. I hope it doesn't spill in. There's no reason that it should spill over until the um, next day. We're going to also have votes on the Republican uh, student loan legislation and on ours. That's what we're doing the next uh, Mr. 36 hours. Oh, I'm sorry. Republican leader. Mr. President, let me just add, I think this is a good agreement that um, allows us to go forward <clears throat> on the um, FDA bill 
with appropriate amendments and also allows an opportunity for the Senate to express itself on the issue of the student loans. I would join the majority leader in encouraging people to do their debate today or in the morning because once we get into the votes tomorrow afternoon, they'll be dealt with in rapid uh, succession. Can I speak? Okay. Mr. President, Senator from Utah. <clears throat> Mr. President, I rise to discuss my amendment that would repeal the costly and counterproductive medical device tax in President Obama's health care law. In the mad scramble to find money to pay for his $2.6 trillion health spending law, the President and his Democratic allies created a number of new taxes that serve no purpose other than to fuel this new spending. Economically, these taxes are a disaster. They will undercut job creation, and they will increase costs for patients. The new 2.3% tax on medical device manufacturers, which kicks in at the beginning of next year, is particularly onerous. For that reason, last year I introduced legislation to repeal it. That bill, the Medical Device Access and Innovation Protection Act, S-17, has been co-sponsored by 25 of my colleagues. They understand that all of Obamacare needs to go. The President's health care law is now over two years old, and it is not aging well. Even before Obamacare became law, the American people made themselves absolutely clear that they wanted nothing to do with this Washington takeover of the nation's health care system. The President and his advisors refused to face reality, telling reluctant Democrats that all was well in spite of the Tea Party town halls. According to the President and Congressional Democrat leadership, as soon as the legislation became law, Americans would come to embrace the wonderful benefits bestowed on them by the Department of Health and Human Services. It has not quite turned out that way. Poll after poll shows that substantial majorities of Americans continue to oppose the law and favor its full repeal. A majority of Democrats think that the law is unconstitutional. And in a matter of weeks, the Supreme Court might issue a coup de grace to President uh, Obama's misguided adventure in big government. Whatever the Supreme Court does, I want to be clear about something. All of Obamacare needs to go. It needs to be pulled out root and branch. The entire thing needs to be repealed. That said, some part of the law, or parts of the law, stand out for their wrongheadedness. The individual mandate and Medicaid expansions are flat out unconstitutional. The IPAB, the Class Act, the Medicare cuts, and the employer mandate all deserve honorable mention for being bad public policy. And among the most counterproductive parts of the law are its over $500 billion in new taxes and penalties. The medical device tax sits at the top of the list of foolish new Obamacare taxes, and my colleagues who have supported S-17 and this amendment understand the critical importance of eliminating it. I want to thank in particular my colleague Senator Brown from Massachusetts and Senator Toomey from Pennsylvania who have spoken on this issue and understand completely the devastation that this tax will create for patients and for, and for employer, employers that provide good jobs for communities in their states. Thanks to Obamacare, medical devices will get hit with a $28 billion tax. And so we are clear about what these medical devices are. They include surgical tools, bedpans, wheelchairs, stethoscopes, and countless other products that patients and doctors rely on every day. Surgical masks, gloves, blood pressure monitors, scissors, needles, cribs, trays, lights, stents, pacemakers, scales, scalpels, inhalers, and ankle, knee, and hip braces, and a lot more. And the cost of all these products is going up thanks to this tax. Somebody's going to have to pay for it. And that somebody is the already overburdened American taxpayer and middle-class breadwinner. The President and his supporters seem to think that you can simply tax corporations and individuals with impunity and face no adverse economic uh, consequences. Yet economists understand that when you tax these companies, employees will pay for it in lower wages. The unemployed will pay for it with a job that was never created. And patients will pay for it with higher health care costs. 
Whatever our economic circumstances, this tax is bad news. But it is particularly foolish given the precarious state of our economic recovery. The President once liked to tout all of the jobs created or saved by his over $800 billion stimulus bill. Yet by supporting the medical device tax, the President and his allies have shown a real disregard for good, high-paying American jobs. Medical device companies employ nearly half a million people. They pay a salary that is nearly 40 percent higher than the national average. These manufacturers are small businesses that we must be cultivating if our economy is going to recover and we're going to, bring, and, and we're going to be successful in bringing down unemployment. Roughly 80 percent of medical device companies have fewer than 50 employees. 98 percent have fewer than 500 employees. Obamacare's $28 billion tax hike on these manufacturers will do nothing to improve health care, but it will do plenty to undercut the viability of these companies that provide good wages and good opportunities for American families. According to one recent analysis, the medical device industry provided jobs to 409,000 employees in 2009. Yet this tax could result in job losses in excess of 43,000. And it will hit certain states harder than others, California, Florida, Illinois, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. My state as well, the state of Utah. The presence of medical device manufacturers is significant in all of these states. This new tax will roughly double the device industry's total tax bill and raise its average effective corporate income tax rate to one of the highest effective tax rates faced by any industry in the world. The President and his allies frequently attack industries that choose to move their operations overseas, but they do not seem to grasp that their policies are driving these industries to do just that. With the onset of this new tax, U.S. device manufacturers are increasingly likely to choose plants in the United States and replace them with plants in foreign countries. According to another report by the Lewin Group, the medical technology industry contributes nearly $382 billion in economic output to the U.S. economy every year. And President Obama, in the middle of a weak economy facing high rates of joblessness, has decided to attack that industry. It's bewildering to me. An industry that pays workers on average $84,156, 1.85 times the national average, has become a victim of the President's desire to pay for his new health spending law. Or better put, those workers and the families they support become the victims of the President's health spending law. In my own home state of Utah, the device tax is an issue of great importance. There are over 120 medical device companies in my home state of Utah. As the Utah Technology Council wrote in a letter to me, these companies, quote, are a vibrant part of the Utah economy providing high-paying, high-tech jobs for citizens of our great state, unquote. They certainly are all of that. And they are under assault as a result of this tax, targeted for nothing other than their success and the fact that they were a so-called stakeholder that could pay its so-called fair share to subsidize the President's health spending bonanza. Mr. President, I request that, uh, that that letter be included in the record at this point. No objection. And just yesterday, the Governor of Utah, the Honorable Gary Herbert, sent a letter to Congress addressing the negative impact this tax will have on our state. He wrote, quote, as the Governor of a state with a significant concentration of medical technology manufacturers, I believe this tax could harm U.S. global competitiveness, stunt medical innovation, and result in the loss of tens of thousands of good-paying jobs, unquote. Now, there is little doubt that the President's medical device tax, one that unfortunately received the vote of every Democrat in the Senate, will do just that, kill jobs and undercut our economy. Mr. President, I ask that Governor Herbert's letter be included in the record at this point. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, the President's health care law is a travesty. The American people know it. They think that it is fundamentally illegitimate, unconstitutional to its core, and enacted over the deep and loud objections of citizens and taxpayers. All 2,700 pages of that law must be stricken from the U.S. Code one way or another. Eliminating its medical device tax is absolutely essential. It is critical for our states, for our economy, and for America's families and workers. 
I ask for my colleagues to join the repeal effort, and I thank my colleagues who have already joined as co-sponsors. Mr. President, I would like to briefly touch on one other issue that is of great importance to me and to the people of Utah and others all over the country. Over 150 million Americans regularly consume dietary supplements as a mean of, means of improving and maintaining their health. The passage of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, or DSHEA, in 1994 brought clarity, predictability, and a better understanding of what the FDA expected from industry and vice versa. DSHEA provides an appropriate structure that balances the risks and benefits to consumers with continued access and affordability. Unfortunately, my colleague from Illinois, Senator Durbin, has filed an amendment to the current bill that would undo that well-balanced approach. As the author of DSHEA, along with my dear friend and colleague, Senator Harkin, in the Senate, I strongly oppose his amendment. It would require facilities engaged in the manufacturing, processing, packing, or holding of dietary supplements to register with the FDA, provide a description with a list of all ingredients as well as, copy, as a copy of the labeling for each dietary supplement product. Additionally, the facilities must also register with respect to new, reformulated, and discontinued dietary supplement products. And while I appreciate my colleague's commitment, his amendment is based on the misguided presumption that the current regulatory framework for dietary supplements is flawed and that the FDA lacks authority to regulate these products. This is simply not the case. Previous FDA commissioners, including Drs. Jane Henney, Mark McClellan, Les Crawford, and Andy Von Eschenbach, as well as the former Deputy Commissioner Dr. Josh Sharfstein, have all agreed that DSHEA provides an appropriate and sufficient level of oversight of this industry. Under DSHEA, Congress set out a legal definition of what could be marketed as a dietary supplement and safety standards that products have to meet. It allowed the FDA to develop good manufacturing practice standards and clarified what types of claims could be made. And it provided the Secretary of Health and Human Services with the authority to impose an immediate ban on any dietary supplement that poses an, inim an, inim an imminent risk to public health. DSHEA already provides the Secretary with enforcement tools of seizure, injunction, or criminal prosecution for ingredients that pose an unreasonable risk of illness or injury, are poisonous or deleterious, contain unapproved drugs or, or food additives, or fail to meet good manu practi manufacturing practice standards. Furthermore, under the Dietary Supplement and Non-Prescription Drug Consumer Protection Act, a manufacturer, packer, or distributor whose name appears on the label is required to report a serious adverse event related to the use of a supplement within 15 business days to HHS, submit any related medical information received within one year of the initial report within 15 business days, maintain records uh, related to each report for six years, and permit inspection of such records. To me, that sounds like a whole lot of regulation. The FDA already has a tremendous amount of regulatory oversight and enforcement tools when it comes to dietary supplements. Yet instead of urging FDA to use its current enforcement authority to find and publish those companies that are not following the law, Senator Durbin's amendment serves to punish all responsible companies with its overreaching mandate. Or should I say mandates? Finally, I would, I would be remiss if I did not mention another obvious point. Senator Durbin's amendment would have the devastating effect of piling on more work for an underfunded agency already struggling to keep above water with its current core responsibilities. Now let me just say this. Before we passed the SHEA, there basically was no regulation over this industry. We brought together, Senator Harkin and I, the whole dietary supplement industry to get behind the SHEA. They are behind it. It took over 10 years to get the good manufacturing practices completed by FDA. More than 10 years, as a matter of fact. But we provided for them in that agreement. We provide all the tools that are necessary 
to supervise and regulate dietary supplements. And to now add other obligations onto this industry is just plain not right. And I hope my colleagues in the United States Senate and the House of Representatives will recognize that this is an overreach and not put up with it. We're not going to put up with it. I will be voting against Senator Durbin's amendment, and I urge all of our colleagues to do the same. And at this point, I'd like to pay tribute to my colleague, Senator Harkin, from Iowa. Senator Harkin worked assiduously on this uh, bill, just uh, along with me. We worked all the way through the Senate on a number of occasions on various things. We've improved the bill from time to time. We've gone along with the improvements. We've done everything we can to protect the American citizens. Everything that should be done, nothing further needs to be done. This is an industry that really deserves support, not condemnation. And Senator Harkin has been there every step of the way. He's a champion for the dietary supplement industry, as am I, and a lot of others in this body. I think it's time to quit trying to overregulate everything to death and cause the, the cost to go up by leaps and bounds. Dietary supplements are not inexpensive today, although they are, they are a lot less expensive than they would be if we keep piling on these regulations. And frankly, we believe that we have all of the necessary language in law today to protect the American public from uh, deleterious dietary supplements. And we've given FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, all the authority that they need. And every FDA commissioner has met with me, as I recall, since Deshaies was passed in 1994, and have said that they have enough tools to be able to supervise this industry properly and that they don't really need anything more. Make a long story short, again, this is an overreach by our colleague, uh, who, sincere though he may be, and as important as he may be. And I would hope that he'll withdraw his amendment so that we don't have to go through this uh, again. But I, if he won't, then I hope that all of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle, because this is a bipartisan effort, on both sides of the aisle will rise up and say, we've had enough of this, and let's vote these kind of amendments down. With that, I yield the floor to my, uh, yield the floor. Mr. President, Senator from Iowa. Mr. President, I want to thank uh, the Senator from Utah for his concluding remarks regarding the amendment that will, that I assume will be offered, at least it's clear to be offered by the Senator from Illinois. Uh, I, I just want to, again, thank Senator Hatch for his great leadership on the issue of making sure that the American people can have access to healthy, uh, life-supporting uh, vitamins, minerals, supplements, without having it to go through untold processes and, and reviews and approvals by FDA and all that kind of regulation. Uh, Senator Hatch was the leader on the Deshea bill when we passed it in 1994. I was happy to work in tandem with him on that. And it has proven through the years to be a great success and for the American people. American people all over this country take vitamins and supplements. They're healthier. They want to take charge of their own health. And they're living healthier because of this. I just I say to my friend from Utah, I, I heard the senator from Illinois yesterday here on the floor give a very impassioned speech about a very sad case about a young woman who had evidently consumed uh, some energy drinks with a lot of caffeine, uh, had heart arrest and died. Very sad story, a very sad story. But as sad as that is, you know, you can't, you just can't keep people that, that, that abuse things. I mean, I, I've said there, there are people who die every year in this country from aspirin poisoning. They take too many aspirin. So, you know, a reasonableness have, has to enter into this. Uh, we have, we've worked together to make sure that the labels are good on all of these things, that people know what's in them, that FDA has the authority. As the senator said, the FDA, every commissioner said they have the authority to keep dangerous products off the shelves and to remove them from the shelves. They have all that authority. So, you know, 
these cases like Senator Durbin brought up, they're sad. They're very sad, and you wish it weren't so. But I don't think that that lends itself then to overturning what has been working now for 18 years. Well, 17 going on, 18 years. Working well for the American people. So I, I, I just joined with the senator from Utah. I, I would hope that uh, the amendment might, be, uh, might not come up. But if it does, it does. And, uh, and I'm sure there'll be some debate on it. But I would uh, join with the senator in Utah in urging all members of the Senate uh, to, to, to vote that amendment down. Uh, if the amendment is come up, I would, I, would, I would move to table that amendment, I say to my friend from Utah. And hopefully that uh, we can approach this in a much more judicious, responsible, thinking manner. Now, I would just say to my friend from Utah, and I know he agrees with me on this, we, I, I'm sure we're not taking the position that nothing can ever be changed. And we've changed the shade in the past to make it work better. But we've done it after due deliberation and thoughtfulness and committee hearings and going through the process to see just what this means in terms of access uh, to these products uh, by the American people and to make sure that we keep the intent of Deshay uh, there. So again, uh, I'm more than willing as chairman of the committee, senators that used to be chairman of this committee, <laughs> I was chairman at one time and ranking member, uh, that we're, we're always willing to look at these things and take a hearing on it and get information. So I, again, I just thank the senator from Utah. He's been a great leader on this. I, I, I appreciate his thank you. Uh, appreciate his leadership on this matter. And I know that Senator Durbin's very sincere, but my gosh, there's enough regulation and regulatory authority in, in, in this bill, and, and including the amendments that we've added voluntarily over the years, mm -hmm. to resolve any problem that exists. Exactly. And frankly, uh, uh, I hope everybody will vote against the uh, Durbin Amendment. Thank you. I, I thank the Senator from Utah. Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I... Uh, Does this side have remaining on the bill? For, on general debate, 24 and a half minutes. I reserve the balance of my time on the bill. Uh, I would ask uh, if uh, Senator Durbin, who's on the floor, if you'd like to bring up your amendment then, and we could begin debate on the amendment. Senator from Iowa has the floor. Uh, Mr. President, uh, again, consuming my time on the bill, I understand I have, I have 24 minutes left. That is correct. Uh, I would just make a short general statement about the bill. I've talked about it in the past. I don't mean to take too much time, but I just want every senator to know that we are now on uh, the FDA reauthorization bill. Uh, this is reauthorizing the prescription drug user fee, the medical device user fees, uh, then we are authorizing a new program, the generic drug user fee, the biosimilar uh, user fee, uh, and, um, and, uh, and so uh, we're on the bill now. Uh, there are 30 minutes of debate on each amendment that has been listed. Senators know who they are and what those amendments are. I just want to make it very clear that the unanimous consent that we just adopted says that all debate time will expire at 2 p.m. tomorrow. At 2 p.m. tomorrow. So I say to senators, if you want to take your 30 minutes and debate your amendment, now's the time to do it. If you wait too long, 2 o'clock will come tomorrow, 
You won't have the time, and you'll be limited to one minute. There'll be two minutes on each amendment after that, so you'll be limited to just one amendment. So uh, those who have amendments and wish to discuss them, you're guaranteed at least 30 minutes, but all time runs out at 2 p.m. tomorrow. So again, I, I say to senators, uh, if you'd like to talk on your amendment and, and, and make your points, now's the time to do it this afternoon. So I, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President, uh, Senator from Illinois, I have an amendment pending, and I call up Amendment Number 2127. The clerk will report. The Senator from Illinois, Mr. Durbin, proposes Amendment Number 2127. Senators recognized. Mr. President, uh, this amendment is very straightforward. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands among senators, staff, or those who are following this debate as to how many of us got up this morning and took a vitamin pill, but I'll say this senator did. And I didn't have a prescription for my vitamin pill. I went and bought it voluntarily. I don't know if it does any good, but it's my decision, right? I voluntarily made that decision. I think that's a good thing. The Food and Drug Administration is an agency which takes a look at what we buy and what we consume. And it has an important responsibility. When it comes to certain things like prescription drugs, they test them. Maybe the pharmaceutical company actually does the testing, but the FDA monitors to make sure that what is given to you by your doctor is safe, won't kill you, and effective. Does what it says it's going to do. Same thing true for over-the-counter drugs. Food and Drug Administration has that responsibility. And when it comes to the ingredients, the dosage, those sorts of things are established through the Food and Drug Administration based on disclosures by the companies, testing, experience, it's all there. But there's another world out there, a completely different world called dietary supplements, which includes the vitamin pill I took this morning, as did the chairman. That is a much different world. It is a world with less disclosure, less transparency, and far less regulation. In fact, in fact, there is no requirement in the law today, none, that the people who sell us dietary supplements have to register with the Food and Drug Administration the name of their product, the ingredients it contains, and a copy of the label. That's what my amendment says. We don't require any testing by dietary supplement companies. We don't require any assertions of safety just simply that they register with the FDA that they're selling in America. So that to me seems like a pretty basic thing. And it isn't my idea. It isn't an original idea. It comes from a report from the General Accountability Office in 2009. Here's what they recommended after they made a uh, review of the safety issues with the Food and Drug Administration to improve the information available to FDA for identifying safety concerns and better enable FDA to meet its responsibility to promote the public health. We, the GAO, recommend that the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services direct the Commissioner of the FDA to request authority to require dietary supplement companies to identify themselves as a dietary supplement company as part of existing registration requirements and update this information annually, provide a list of all dietary supplement products they sell and a copy of the labels and update this information annually and report all adverse events related to the dietary supplements. In other words, did you take the pill and get sick? Does that seem like an onerous, heavy-handed, big government over-regulation of an industry? Remember, the dietary supplement companies are not all based in the United States. There are products sitting on the shelf, which if you don't look carefully, you may not know, come from a lot of other countries, including China. So do we want to know? When you go in the vitamin store, would you like to know that the company that's selling you, whatever it is, is at least registered in the United States? Is that too much to ask, that if you're going to sell the product in the United States, you have to register with the FDA and tell us what the ingredients are? That to me seems pretty basic. I bet, I'll bet you 99% of American people thought, I thought they already did that. No, they don't. No requirement in the law. Dietary supplements outside the law. And let me tell you, dietary supplements are go beyond the vitamin pill. Yesterday I told the story on the floor. 16-year-old girl in Hagerstown, Maryland, she drank 
two monster energy drinks. You ever seen them? When you go in a store, you see Cokes and all the rest of those things, and, and there's a monster energy drink. There are all kinds of them out there. She drank two of them and died. Killed her. Cardiac arrest. I met with her mom yesterday. She said, I ran in there. Her boyfriend said she stopped breathing while watching TV. She was dead on the floor. They took her to the hospital, barely got her back to life for a little while, and she lingered and died just a few days later. It was a dietary supplement. Is it too much to ask the company making the Monster Energy drink to register with the FDA and tell us what the ingredients are in that drink? Is that the heavy hand of government? I don't think so. Because here's what we found. Sometimes ingredients that may appear to be benign and okay today turn out to be dangerous when you look at it more carefully, more closely, and maybe more dangerous for pe people who are younger or pregnant or in a compromised immune situation. So this amendment basically says American consumers have the right to know that the dietary supplement sitting on the shelf has at least shown up and registered with the FDA. I heard Senator Hatch and Senator Harkin say this just goes too far. It's too much to ask. I think they're wrong. Manufacturers already, some say, already voluntarily provide product labels to the National Institutes of Health. It's true, but it's a voluntary system. Good actors share their labels with the NIH, but the bad actors don't. NIH is in the process of building a label database that currently has 7,500 7, dietary supplement labels. Do you know how many products are on the market? They have 7,500 labels? 75,000. 75,000. So 10% are volunteering this information. So to say the NIH already has the information is 90% wrong. Requiring registration, they say, of these labels is just too much work for the FDA. No, as a matter of fact, the FDA responded to the GAO uh, recommendation and said, we agree the agency's ability to ensure the safety of dietary supplements used by consumers would be improved if FDA had more information on the identity of firms marketing dietary supplements as well as the identity and compositions of the products they market. The FDA responded by saying, we want this information to keep Americans safe. So to argue that this is a burden that we shouldn't put on the FDA, they asked for it. The other thing is about how many supplements are being sold in the United States. I said 75,000. That was the estimate in 2008. The number, I'm afraid, is much larger. And in terms of how many come on the market each year, it's just a guess. It's a wild guess because it's the Wild West. It's an open market. Any country that wants to export their dietary supplement to the United States, whether it's from China or India or Africa or Europe or Mexico, be my guest. You don't even have to show up and register with the FDA. It's a simple amendment. It just says if you want to do business in the U.S., sell your dietary supplement, tell us who you are, tell us what you're selling, tell us what your label looks like. That's not too much to ask to protect families from some harmful consequences. I reserve the balance of my time. Mr. President, I ask NAMS consent that the time Senator Hatch used be counted retroactively against the time in opposition to my amendment number 2127. Without objections, so ordered.